Hello, I'm Peter Coombs and I'm presenting on borrowing from nature to create self-organizing systems frameworks of big data to understand urban water systems. So that's quite a mouthful, but this is a contribution to the Social Responsibilities of Algorithms Conference. And the way that I've interpreted the brief here is around algorithms that actually enhance social capacity to understand and respond to decision making. So as, as we all know, the future of cities is dependent on water cycle resources. And we have mature analysis processes but we are continually surprised by droughts, floods, social impacts, environmental damage, and a wide range of things. In, in recent history, indeed over the last 20 years, our cities have been subject to a wide range of shocks from pandemic through to fires, floods, droughts, um, changing economic circumstances, um, uncertainty of employment, um, an endless array of shocks. So those shocks actually change the way we behave and respond. So these behaviours and responses aren't really captured by economic and engineering averages and approximations because they are a number about how much water we use or how much money we will consume or, or those sorts of assumptions. However, those static numbers are actually behavioural, part of behavioural responses that are quite different. So this process I'm talking about is about understanding behaviours. At the moment, we've got inadequate data and a lack of access around urban water systems, and that um, access to data is increasingly narrowing due to um, privacy and confidentiality um, and commercial incompetence assumptions in government across society. We also use deterministic algorithms and static assumptions to do our water planning. So this presentation explores methods used to provide a systems perspective uh, and to unpack uh, what's going on with our urban water systems and to produce alternative perspectives of what the futures might hold. So the motivation for this presentation is the need for a systems approach rather than a deterministic methods that we currently use. After all, we live in a system and, and that, that system is not a collection of isolated silos. And if you work in the policy space, it's pretty clear that policy applies at multiple distributed scales across a system, but usually result in local actions. And if you're discussing implications of policy, you're always talking about a multidisciplinary process and a system of trade-offs and what interventions can we make. And these, these interventions are really hard to understand if we're only using siloed or linear approaches around one particular idea rather than the con context of the entire system. So solutions derived from deterministic partial analysis of systems cannot provide or produce uh, expected outcomes across society. So this one might be one of the explanations why we continue to be surprised by droughts, floods and everything else, even though we have mature systems of analysis. In any event, how do we understand how to intervene in our constantly changing system to make a better future? I guess the concept of a realistic decision space takes us to some of these uh, ideas. We're always talking about the one best solution um, and we see it 
every other day in the media and policy discussions. But they're in fact a large solution space with multiple outcomes, depending on your perspective. And that this is this bottom uh, frame Venn diagram here of we can have the green space is the entire set of potential solutions. And if, say, we're just narrowly comparing environmental benefits versus life cycle costs, and obviously at the, the frontier of that, the dark line that's known as a Pareto frontier, they're, they're the best options. There's not, even in that unrestricted decision space, there's not one single best option. There are a range of best options depending on social norms and political decisions and a whole range of other things that, that are well beyond the tech, technocrats. However, when we constrain our solutions um, by by producing by our algorithms or what we don't understand or, or our assumptions, we're making decisions in a constrained solution space. So how do we really understand the trade-offs? And if we take a look at the top graph, it's talking about society costs versus the costs of, of one provider, say a water monopoly versus the whole of society costs. And obviously, in that arrangement with the red arrows here and the, the orange arrow there, there are positive and negative externalities. If your frame of reference is only the, the, the entity providing goods and services, so the, the other costs are actually considered to be externalities. Ideally, we would internalize these externalities so we could understand the whole of society impacts in making our decisions. So we have average and siloed versus accumulative and connected processes of decision making. And, and clearly this impacts on a linked and non-linear system. So here is a, a diagram of cumulative processes in a, a urban catchment, which is these A through to G um, subcatchments. Um, of an urban area that gets its water supply from some other catchment elsewhere, uh, but is managing stormwater and sewage services and you know waterways and environmental impacts within that city and on the receiving waterway, say a river. As you can see by these changing hydrographs of, of runoff from a single property allotment, numbers of allotments, from a subcatchment all the way down to the catchment. The red is a traditional approach and the blue is taking a whole more holistic view of how those runoff vents change. This is pointing out in a cumulative linked system, a range of opportunities, for instance, like shown in uh, this insert of subcatchment G, actually changes those responses and we can't see it if we're taking a narrow view of a system around uh, more singular and linear assumptions. The same could be said, say, for spatial impacts. Here is uh, the Greater Melbourne water system. Uh, the top spatial graph here is the distances, the darker the colour, the longer distances from the nearest water supply uh, source across Greater Melbourne. You can see there's um, some very long transfer distances there and underneath is a water pathway. It's the slice through um, the infrastructure providing a solution in any one part of the city. You can see that um, it's definitely not a 3D linear pathway. Um, the bottom graph down here, spatial graph, is the distances for sewage supplies uh, disposal. And the same issue if you take a slice through any one of those supply links, you can see there's a, a completely variable topography. So cities are different everywhere from demographics and water use perspective, from climate, income, dryness, population, there's strong temporal and spatial variations in most drivers of city behaviours. These are cumulative and non-linear. 
And here is a spatial map of water demands across Greater Melbourne. You can see there's a wide variation across the city, so it's not average. Um, and we can see of the outer local government area demographics, the household sizes and the mix of dwellings are completely different to say the inner city local government areas. Um, and that changes the characteristics of behavior. So moving towards systems thinking, uh, this presentation and why applied science uh, research journey for over two decades borrows heavily from Meadows' work, um, which I've referenced at the bottom of this slide. So in her view, the next paradigm to understand future challenges and policies to intervene in an increasingly complex world where bottom-up hierarchical self-organizing systems frameworks of behavior. So we're moving from this traditional siloed uh, thinking through to this highly interconnected systems thinking paradigm. And one of the outputs to this type of thinking is some work from Michael Barry and myself, which I'll talk to the diagram here, where we use the bottom-up systems analysis, which is in the blue on the graph, and it shows that water efficiency, as you, this is a probability density function of water, major water transfers throughout a city. In this case, it's one of the major ones across Greater Melbourne. Um, you can see that the that business as usual, continue as we are, uh, probability of, of peak flows in that water transfer system has this form, which is the, under the cursor here. If we are more water efficient, clearly we're, we're actually changing that uh, probability of peak flow to, a, to a, a lesser peak flow and we're changing the distribution somewhat. However, the, the red curve here is when we use the traditional top-down average analysis where under the red curve, distribution here, we have both the water efficient and the business as usual um, demands flowing through the system for Melbourne. You can't see the difference. Um, but also, the probability distribution so that show is completely different to when we've had a more, more detailed systems analysis um, of what those flows are likely to be. So the flows are, probability of flows are higher and the distribution is sharper and different. It creates an illusion of no benefits from doing something different, in this case, distributed solutions and water efficiency. How do we do this systems analysis? Well, we borrowed from nature in large part. So molecular biology around the, the structure of DNA, four acids, A, T, C, and G, in pairs, in a framework, provide code for replication. Enzymes within that system catalyze the process of combining resources based on the DNA code to reproduce the um, new structures. So four base pairs of DNA order the dynamic processes to reproduce structure and behavior. And I've got some nice diagrams here. At the top is the, the structure, of, uh, simplified structure of DNA, and the bottom structure is the original DNA code being replicated in the polymerase enzyme process to produce um, new cells. Let's think about how important that is. This process can actually map out all types of life, fundamentally different, based on four assets and a framework of inputs. So this coding structure of order and sequencing can be utilized to produce the dynamics and typologies of behavior in, in system framework models. And this is what we've done. However, we need to combine that with non-parametrics. We don't know what the algorithms are. 
and we know that we certainly know they're not fixed in time and we know we've got missing and incomplete data and the data we're using say in flooding and climate is non-stationary and, and behaviors are changing all the time so we have unknowable deterministic relationships however we can combine artificial intelligence with with non-parametric methods with the frameworks provided to us from DNA to overcome these knowledge challenges. So our traditional algorithms use small portions of data and fixed functional form. We're saying here you don't need a fixed functional form provided you have a framework and, and um, the right linking parameters. And this is based on nearest neighborhood schemes, decision trees, vectors, frameworks, based on a memory of behavior and a knowledge of how those frameworks change across scale. And we're not throwing out any data, we're actually using it all to have ideas. So there's a, a simplistic plot here that I've provided of what I call the traditional de deterministic policy process and an area of deterministic certainty in that triangle, blue triangle, of say between economics, environment and water resources. And in the bigger diagram here, we're showing the overlap of areas of un uncertainty of multiple layers of big data that is self-reinforcing. So if multiple layers of data that all might be uncertain but overlap uh, consistently in areas, they're telling us information about the system. So sets of information are telling us what the behaviours are going to be rather than a deterministic algorithm. So we need to unpack this though, and we, we borrow from Nash Games um, game theory and, and, and two particular social dilemmas. So we're accounting for actors with different preferences at link scales. And the solution space provided by Nash non-cooperative games. So the best response to anyone's and everyone's actions to maximize benefit. That's, that's what we assume unlocks this uh, multi-dimensional space for us. Um, we've got this problem of um, the, the top drawing I like particularly, um, which ensure we don't have unintended consequences from our actions. But we also have to take us away from this dynamic adjustment of behavior, which is self-interested dynamics and self-interest to follow ex external agreement. So we're in a situation where prisoner's dilemma is a paradox in which individuals acting their own self-interest do not produce an optimal outcome. When our systems model with its feedbacks is showing us that, it then indicates to us we actually need a pol external policy intervention to try and change behavior because in or else we end up with tragedy of the commons outcomes where the continuity of maximizing in individual gains results in society loss so you can build those paradigms and indeed we have in into a systems analysis to understand these issues so here's a system framework of big data um, it's, it links scales, um, it has hierarchy of scales in multi-dimensional space, it's cumulative, it has feedback loops. Um, it's built up from the bottom, not from the top. Um, it's built on continuous simulation linked by a small number of common parameters. And an idea of one of the feedback loops would be price, another would be water restriction, bigger picture feedback loops would be economic circumstances, reserve bank interest rates, and so on. So our local response, and, and here's a, a spatial plot of Sydney's water demands at the bottom and, and the top uh, diagram is hindcasting of one of the local government areas where we didn't have a lot of information. However, we have some historical memory of local and regional behaviors. You can see here, we've been able to reproduce the, um, the behavior in that local government area uh, from average information uh, quite well. 
we're unpacking it using all sorts of different information in the system framework, demographic and socioeconomic typologies, continuous simulation to produce a, a library of behaviours linked by four environmental parameters to the entire system. So the demand, which are wants, are modified by feedback into supply, which are the needs. As you can see here, this has produced an astounding regional response, which accounts for regional daily demands, but includes behaviour change and responses to multiple feedback loops in history. And this is highlighted by these probability density plots over here under my cursor. So the top distribution is, is the Melbourne before and during drought. You can see the, uh, the analysis without engineering or economic fixed parameters has been able to completely reproduce um, these complex array of feedback influences and behaviours, water restrictions, advertising about drought, economic changes to produce um, almost identical behavioural responses. And the same too in the bottom graphs, the, the, the Sydney system is the top and the Melbourne system is the bottom of those graphs. So that's a pretty outstanding result. We can also include regional processes of policy, water restrictions, economic drivers, prices, incentives, um, you know, uh, incentives for water efficient appliances, incentives for rainwater tanks, incentives, uh, price changes, climate change, environmental regulations, because our model is actually based on behaviours, not fixed parameters. So if the climate changes, we'll get a behavioural response, and that's what we need to understand. And the hindcasting of model results across periods of known performance provides certainty. So this top graph here have completely reproduced the total economic costs in the greater Ballarat water supply system, Central Highland system in Victoria. Uh, that's a pretty outstanding result and provides new insights. So the bottom is the spatial costs of water supply and sewage services across Greater Sydney. Uh, the new knowledge is there, those spatial costs uh, vary from $4 a kilolitre to well in excess of $25 a kilolitre. So that's definitely new knowledge to shape our thinking. So finally, the, the insights from this presentation is that systems framework ideas link actions across multiple scales and interests. It deconstructs information across spatial and temporal scales to reproduce system dynamics, and we've shown you a flavour of that. The ideas from molecular biology and game theory in the concept of artificial intelligence influences and has driven this process, is giving us new insights on existing processes. So the big data framework overcomes missing and incomplete information that constrains traditional analysis. If we don't have enough information, we can't use the algorithm, so we can't continue. This process uses multiple, multiple layers of information to find out sets of information and artificial intelligence to find out what the answers are most likely to be. And advances in computing power permit this quantum process to be driven by continuous simulation. A transition from a separate reductionist methods to expansive analysis of systems is what's what's being pro proposed and pioneered here. It provides an understanding of cum cumulative impacts and trade-offs. So in the brief of, of this conference, it's a process to unpack limited information um, and imperfect data to empower society choices Thank you for your time.